The History of Identity Management Your identity is valuable. Thousands of organisations want to know who you are, what you do and where you're from. They also collect information about you both invitedly and uninvitedly. Why? Because they want to make sure you meet your obligations, or because they manage something you may be entitled to, or because they want to sell you something. You hate to think what would happen if someone stole your identity. All of a sudden your bank account is wiped clean, or your passport isn't recognised when you go on holiday, or the police arrest you in the middle of the night because someone else has committed fraud in your name. Thankfully, the Netherlands has laid a very sound foundation for the handling of identity information. But does it work as efficiently as it should? Do you know which data have been recorded about you? What do you do when something goes wrong? And is the way in which we determine and verify a person's identity still up to date? In order to provide you with some background information, we want to take you on a trip through history. We start with the Roman Empire. Emperor Augustus decided to have every person in the world register every five years. In doing so, he provided a numeric basis for all sorts of long-term planning, such as the construction of roads and aqueducts and the leasing out of state land. We see these sorts of consensus throughout history. They were often regional, but sometimes also on a larger scale. However, their most important aim was to levy taxes and recruit soldiers. In addition to the worldly authority, there was the church. The church wanted to know who belonged to their community and who did not. If you lived according to God's law, you could look forward to a nice place in the afterlife. And it didn't harm your case to make a financial contribution once in a while. And everything was neatly registered. Just like in the time of Napoleon, he introduced civil registration to the Netherlands with certificates for births, marriages, divorces and deaths. The small emperor was banished, but his records were continued. In addition to civil registration, the population register was implemented in 1850, which was based on an earlier census. In the years to come, the population register turned out to be a versatile and helpful tool which linked statutory rights and duties to the correct people, including universal suffrage. In 1917, all men in the Netherlands received the right to vote, and women received the same right in 1919. Thanks to the population register, it was easy to trace who was allowed to vote. World War II made it clear that there was a dark side to having a population register, the German occupiers hijacked the registration of a person's religion and origin. The efficient population records now served a much more sinister purpose. After World War II, the government started to create the welfare state. Politician Willem Drees introduced the state pension, which was soon followed by unemployment benefit, invalidity benefit, student finance and social assistance benefit, which are all social security benefits that are granted to the right people thanks to the careful registration of various data. The Netherlands soon became a richer nation and the world lay at its feet. More and more people could afford to go on holiday or travel abroad for business and vice versa, more and more people travelled to the Netherlands. The growing influx of travellers and migrants urged the government to register who travelled into and out of the country and who had the right to be here for studies, work or take up residence with family. Establishing and verifying a person's identity became a profession in its own right, which required expertise and international cooperation. The developments in the 21st century took identity management to the next level. Since 9-11, the entire world has been focused on safety. The tragic events on that day resulted in a big dilemma. Governments were able to track down terrorists by collecting and interpreting data, but this immediately evoked an image of the government as a big brother. In the 21st century, international cooperation also became more intensive. For instance, an EU-wide decision was made to include a digital photograph and fingerprints in EU passports, which made forgery more difficult. Another major development in this century concerned the developments in the digital industry. Everybody is on Facebook, Twitter and Google Plus nowadays. People don't think twice about posting things online. The people they know, photographs and videos. I share, therefore I am. People can pay online with ideal or credit card and leave their identity information on the website of web stores. Companies can create a profile of you based on your buying or web surfing behaviour or even your emails. Why do things the hard way? Everything you need is right there and you don't have to look for it. And the government? The government has also increased its digital operations. 
When a child is born, the father usually registers the birth at the town hall, after which the child is allocated a citizen service number and is entered into the Municipal Personal Records database, which is communicated to the Early Childhood Clinic and the Social Insurance Bank. All it takes is logging in with Dihi Day to apply for child benefit. This is how the Netherlands has created a solid foundation for the handling of identity information. Many government institutions use the Municipal Personal Records Database, the Citizen Service Number and Dihi Day. We have an excellent passport and ID card which are difficult to forge thanks to the latest techniques. Migrants who cannot be entered into the Municipal Personal Records Database are registered in the Central Shared Database with basic information on applicants and receive a travel document and or residence permit. But there's still room for improvement especially when it comes to the equipment and software we use and the rules of the game, because they often seem to operate in different worlds. And if you're wrongly registered somewhere, or if someone has stolen your identity, how can you find your data in that enormous web of registrations? Or how about the vulnerability of websites and apps, which have exposed personal information of thousands of people on so many occasions? And how should we prepare for the future? How can we use the valuable data for long-term planning, the housing and labour markets, infrastructure and so on? What are the options of iris scans, facial recognition, fingerprints and even DNA? What are the advantages and how can we protect ourselves from misuse and all forms of identity theft? How do we safeguard the balance between privacy, safety, user-friendliness and efficiency? The Dutch government has set up a program to find an answer to these questions. This is aimed at a more efficient, effective and precise handling of identity information and an improved collaboration of the cooperating organisations, both in the determining registration, verification and exchange of information and the prevention and fighting of fraud and errors. This is necessary because many things have changed over the years, but one thing has remained the same. Your identity is valuable and you should protect it.